Welcome to the Food Envy podcast where we explore the visual side of food. Today I'm here at the amazing Oarsman in Marlow where I'm speaking to head chef Scott Smith. Hey Scott, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, how are you? Very well, very well. Thank you so much for letting me do this today. That's no, a pleasure. Thanks so for coming. So exciting to come in and talk to you about your food and your style and stuff like that. So maybe just as a brief outline, you can give us a quick 60 seconds on sort of your career and a little bit about your food style. Yeah, so I come from a little town in Scotland called Oban. So I started cooking there straight fresh out of school as a kitchen porter. I started cooking in a small hotel. Done a few years there and then moved to Glasgow to work under Chris Sharlambis at um, Kilbrook. And then when I, I was there my whole time in Glasgow, I was working at Kilbrook. And then I moved to London. I spent time in London working briefly under Jason Atherton. Then I worked for years under uh, Anthony Dimitri. And then I moved to, to work for Bryn Williams at Dets in Primrose Hill. And then I took my first head chef's job back up in Scotland, a place called uh, The Sugar Boat. And then I got the opportunity to come down and, and open the Oarsman's. And what experiences did you get from those different places that sort of, clearly cooking, that's the main impact that I'm sure working in these amazing places had. But visually, was there one that really kind of stood out for this is a style that I want to, to be known for? This is the style I enjoy? I mean, my two biggest influences, I would say, are Anthony and Chef Bryn. Those, those, those are the two guys that I sort of really sort of started to really sort of learn from and pick up my style, I suppose. So I'd say our style sort of somewhere between Anthony's and Bryn's. Where it's all very sort of clean, classic, nothing too fancy on the plate. But Bryn sort of taught me that the beauty is in the simplicity of food. And I guess really good ingredients, perfectly cooked, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, Anthony was, he, he just got the best ingredients and treated them with the utmost respect. That, that, was, that was Anthony's style to a T, just beautiful ingredients treated properly make, makes your job so much easier <laughs> well i guess when you're so busy in the kitchen that's good and actually adding too many tricks too many twists it gets old quite quickly as it dates yeah what do you think yeah clean ingredients i mean that's certainly i think we were talking just slightly off camera about how that's now more in vogue isn't it I yeah think, compared to the 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 tips and the tricks and yes yeah, it's, it's just all about the, the quality of what you're eating as opposed to sort of what you what you can do with it yeah so now you're head chef here, when you're conceptualizing and creating dishes, because you change your menu quite a lot, don't you? Yeah. How do you start? I'm constantly fascinated by, you know, like writers when they've got a blank page in front of them or a, a, a painter when they're looking at this blank canvas. You've clearly got your, your plate, effectively. How do you start? What, what's, what's your kicking off point? You start with the seasons. You know, we're guided by the seasons. So, so our nature tells us what we should and shouldn't be doing at certain times of the year. You just look at what's in season, what local producers have, uh, uh, and we just go from there. And we also try to make it so that everyone in the kitchen are like to have a bit of input into the menu. So if, if, if someone wants to try something, then we'll, we'll work with that and we just sort of build it like that together. Okay. So that's probably more, I guess, on how you generate the recipe, but when you're coming to actual plating it, do you have a jumping off point? So I've spoken to other chefs and he said, immediately the first thing I do is I, I go to the center of the plate and I build I build from there. Do you sketch anything out? Do you have an idea of what you're doing before? Because I know some chefs have the luxury of time, yeah. <laughs> budget to think and really conceptualize. I'm assuming in a venue like this, there's not so much time, I would imagine. So how do you, is it feel? Is it? It's what, yeah, what, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get our ingredients together and then we'll, we'll take it to the plate and we'll just do what feels natural. Mm -hmm. That's it. I, there's been times where I've sort of sketched things out and I've had an idea of what to do, but at the end of the day, until you've got all your ingredients down and you've got your empty plate in front of you, that's when you know how how to dress things, j just how you're feeling. In terms of things like texture and colour and things like that, so that's generally will just happen and evolve then. So you don't think if you've got some like red beetroot or something that's hugely in season, yeah, that's the jumping off point. In terms of sort of colour and, and, and texture and things, th these things are... The, the, their natural progression so the amount of times you, you'll do a dish you play with it not happy with it we'll go away and tweak it all the all these things just sort of flow and happen naturally how long have you been sort of professional chef for roughly uh well just 16 years now i think years yeah so how much have you seen the importance of the visual side of the plate change have you have you seen a massive because clearly you know it's one of those things that uh has has always been important because we eat with our eyes but because of the instagram generation stuff like that and having to make your food look visually appealing how much have you seen that sort of creep into your the importance creep into what you do here it's very important we, we try to focus on the taste sort of more than the look it does have to look appealing especially now with with social media yeah. people expect food to be 
pretty and, and beautiful and almost like you don't want to eat it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's changed a lot from when I started. When I started to swell, it's sort of, we always say that Scotland's maybe five years behind London. Okay. And where I came from in Scotland was five years behind the rest of Scotland. <laughs> so when I started cooking, it was very much sort of like classic. 80s Novu where everything was stacked super classic so I, I've 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 seen a lot a lot of changes throughout my career yeah and I guess that's kind of social media has probably sped that up hasn't it really I would think yeah absolutely. and certainly you know when people played stuff specific for Instagram and stuff it's one of the things you can you can tell I, I completely appreciate you still need the, the the dish to work but it's just interesting to find out how much more the visual is important slash essential you know if you do want to have a good social media, which let's face it, all places probably do. Don't yeah. the, the past few years is the first time ever you're, you're able to see influences from a, around the world had a real impact on the way everyone around the world sort of cooks and dresses. Is there a British style to plating? Is or is because everyone in different kitchens has different nationalities, don't they? Really, There's, you don't just get English guys or Scots guys in this country. You get them from all over the place. So, is there a, is there a French style to plating? Is there a I don't know, a, a, a South American style to plating, or is it all pretty much, you know, good plating is good plating? Yeah, I think a good plate is good plate. And I'm sure, I'm sure that the, there was a time when you could maybe differentiate between different cuisines and, mm. and how things are dressed. But I think everything's just sort of emulsified into one sort of big universal yeah. way of plating now. And yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd say that's probably about right. Will you ever sacrifice, you know, taste for visuals, you know, just to add something that maybe just visually looks good um it's one of those things that i know asking a chef i think i know what the answer is going to be but it's just as a home cook you know i will add stuff just because it looks a bit nicer so i'm just wondering are there times where you think i will add this just because it you know that extra little pop of color does really help i mean not not really there's i mean when you want to add color that's sort of the, the, the old school enemies saying that's that's what that's what herbs are for that in terms of just adding something for the sake of it mm. Yeah, not really. No. Okay. I think I think I think I'll stop asking that question. That seems, <laughs> seems to be and probably quite the right the, the right answer. Yeah, because really? that's what you guys are all about. Me, I I would do because my side of this industry is more the visual side, and you know some of the some of the some of the hardest food to photograph is some of the tastiest already, but it just doesn't look good. Things like curry and stuff like that that takes real skill to make that look yeah appetizing. I mean, kind of haggis, neeps, and tatties. <laughs> not it's not a pretty dish, but it's, <laughs> yeah. it's one of, it's one of the best. This, go and add things. Well, if you ever find a good picture of that, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> do you try and because obviously you're a proud Scotsman? Do you, do you try and get that into your clearly into your cooking, but into the visual side of it at all? It's difficult with Scottish cooking because Scottish Scottish food's mostly stodge. Yeah which is um, incredible, but again, it doesn't look the prettiest, but mm. some amazing Scottish chefs out there that are really sort of pushing the boundaries and uh, and doing things that I would never even think of. Yeah. Like, like guys like Tom Kitchen, he's just, you look at his food and it's so like quintessentially Scottish, yeah. but it, it it's just so beautiful. So clearly plating for chefs is different to plating at home. Do you have any good tips for the home cook, such as myself, of, of how to how to plate because whenever i see in kitchens you know it's almost military style you've got everything prepped and things like that are there any good tips you can think of that might help the, the home cook at all it's hard to say to someone give someone a tip because every, everyone's different and, yeah. and, and and essentially cooking's an art form mm. and and every everyone's different so what what is beautiful for one person doesn't quite hit the same yeah. for someone else but i mean the one one thing i always say is is just we try and keep it tight and nice and together and not have too much sort of negative space, I suppose you would say. Okay. The one thing I always find myself trying to explain to guys in the kitchen is if you're piping something, mm. in, instead of sort of, if you've got a piping bag or, or a bottle, instead of sort of pulling it up, yep. I tend to, to say to the guys, you hold it at the point you want your dot to finish and then just, just let, let it go naturally and it'll, it'll fall over itself and okay. it'll be perfect. Yeah, I don't know how many people are sort of piping curious at home and stuff. So yeah, piping's not one I do a great a great deal to be honest. When we were chatting uh, over over messages and stuff, you mentioned one of the fa your favourite places to go is St John's in London and the chef Fergus Henderson. Yeah, and again looking up him, he's very much a nose to tell kind of guy. Which again, I imagine when you're talking about offal and things like that, that's a lot harder to then style as well. Yeah, is that something that you do a lot of? here and is that a struggle we do try and use as much sort of awful and and cheaper cuts as you can although there is sort of no such thing as a, as, as a cheap cut anymore really yeah awful awful does take a, a lot more work 
to, to sort of make look pretty. But I mean, one of our sort of signature dishes here is trotters on toast. Which, really? Yeah, which is a nod to sort of Fergus. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's it's simple. It's it's one thing on a plate. It's it's bread that's been fried and beef dripping, and then yeah. trotters and bacon that's brought back in, in a sort of really rich pork sauce and okay. finished with lots of white pepper. Yeah. So it, it's got a got the, the the taste of haggis to it. Okay. It's one thing on a plate, toast and and, and a sort of mound of like braised trotters, but okay. I think it looks stunning. That is kind of blowing my mind right now, just because of the name of it as well. Yeah. <laughs> is that what you call it? Is that what you throw on the on tour? Yeah. Yeah. Is that quite a good, is that a good seller for you? Because yeah. I imagine that's quite a tough sell, I would think. No, it does. It, sell, it sells well, yeah. It sells well. And people are never quite sure what, what they're going to get. I can imagine. But when it gets put down, like I said, it's something so simple. Yeah. But I, for me, it's just beautiful. And the, the simplicity of it tastes quite nice as well, yeah. In terms of visually for that then, was that quite a struggle? And how did you kind of overcome it it wasn't a str- i had a, i had an idea of what we wanted to do right. we've done it mm. and i sat back and i thought that looks all right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it looks nice and it's just sort of because they're so gelatinous it sort of just holds but it's got a little bit of a yeah. wobble to it and it's yeah. just it's, it's just lovely you're gonna have to send me a picture yeah well yeah <laughs> is that is that one because it is such a mystery dish do you do you kind of see people taking a little picture of it and stuff because it's probably it probably doesn't in your mind's eye. See, as soon as you said that, in my mind's eye, I'm thinking like a hoof on toast. Yeah, that, <laughs> and I imagine it's nothing. That's what I will expect. So that for me would be one of those ones because I don't tend to do it in restaurants. That <laughs> take pictures of my food, but yeah, I I possibly would do that just because it probably completely changes your mind about what you're what you're going to get. I mean, some we've seen we've seen some some people mm. take take photos of it. Well. Not long after we opened, we had a visit from a Michelin inspector, and they they put a photo of it up on really? Twitter, and it, yeah. it got absolutely slated. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When 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 people eat it, they enjoy it. Mm. They enjoy it, and I know you, you sort of eat with your eyes, and it's maybe not the most visually appealing to some people, but it, it is what it is, and, mm. and everything's subjective. I I yeah. think it's beautiful. Some people think it's it's boring. That's absolutely true. I mean, with any with any art form, subjectivity is always always the most important thing. As a photographer, I, I see it all the time. And to be honest with you, some things that win awards, you think, how on earth okay. <laughs> has that done it? And it's it's one of those things that is is um you know just throw. Speaking of awards, that's a, that's a good segue to my next question because I saw that um you guys recently won um the no sorry the the newcomer award for the top fifty gastro pubs yeah. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. And also the National Pub and Bar Awards Buckingham. Yeah. Which is all fantastic. How important do you think the visuals was in winning winning competitions? I don't really know. Mm. Like the, these, like winning things like this are a surprise to us. Yeah. Um, you do it. I mean, these these things they want to be able to sell your product without people knowing how it tastes. So yeah. I suppose visually, yeah, it, it is very important. And we do always try and keep things uh, neat and clean and, and, and tidy. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm sure w- when guys come and visit us, they will, they'll, they'll look at they'll look at how the dish looks first be- before they taste it. It's, it's... I, I, I would think so. I would imagine it's hugely unlikely that, you know, places that don't take that time and effort to visually present their foods are really going to, even if it tastes the best, Yeah, it probably, in sort of awards, I would imagine it's going to be very hard to sell. How long ago did you sort of see that change happen to more simple simple presentation of food so the places i've worked as well this sort of incredible cooking mm. and, and sort of no nonsense treating of, of food so i mean i've not spent a lot of time working in places where things are fussed over and, and and things so it's been quite natural for me that everything's always sort of i suppose that's why i've worked in these places because i've mm. been drawn to to people that cook really well and and, mm. and dress so clean and beautifully i've never really sort of seen a change apart from when i left my first job which mm. like I said it was sort of like it was stuck in the early 90s yep. And then when I moved to Glasgow, okay. that's when I sort of opened my eyes to a more modern approach to, to mm. cooking and, and, and dressing. Okay. Have you have you seen any styles that, um, even if you weren't party to, that you just think you're sick to death of seeing? Any sort of plating technique that you think has just been overdone, again, possibly because of social media or anything like I, I know I know the old Salt Bay salt thing is yeah, exactly that... a plating <laughs> style, but people got sick to death of that yeah. pretty fast. Can you think of anything similar that you've seen that is just, was very much in vogue and now it's just, you know, people aren't doing so much. Swipes of puree. That's right. And that that was huge. Mm. Huge. When I when I first sort of moved to the to Glasgow and then London, mm. swipes of purees, they were everywhere. And there was all the different kinds you could do and everything. And even 
like hitting it with a spoon. Yeah. And so, so you get the splatter. All, yeah. That. But you, I mean, you rarely see that now. Okay. Rarely, rarely see that now. But that that used to be massive. Yeah. So you won't see that, I guess, in the, in the higher end places. But you might still see it because there are possibly just not thinking about their plates so much. It's just something they they they've always done. They yeah. Keep doing. Uh, that's it. Yeah. People are still doing it because that's that's what they like. That, mm. That's that's their style, and that's ev- everyone's got a different style. Yeah. But yeah, you, you definitely don't see it as much. Who inspires you then in terms of plate design and stuff? Let's assume their t- food tastes good. Yeah. That's a given. Who is really pushing the buttons of, of what you like visually? I mean, a- Anthony Dimitri, I've, mm. I've, I've never seen someone dress as naturally as he is. He, he, he is incredible. Even yeah. when you're in the kitchen with him, watching him dress mm. food, it is, it, it's, it's amazing. Yep. He's just so natural. He makes it look effortless and his food is always so beautifully presented, so clean. And it was like, it was always a struggle if you were working with Anthony mm. to, to dress to his standard. And, and it was, what is that standard then? Is it is it accuracy? Is it creativity? Is it all of the above? I mean, it's, as somebody who's never worked in a kitchen, what is it that impresses you about what he did? The way Anthony would dress is it it, it, w- it was so precise, and you would know where things are going in the plate. Mm. But if you tried to recreate it, it looked so contrived. <laughs> like you thought about it, but where, whereas Anthony can do it, and it's just. It's like it's just sort of been placed. Yep. Look, and and it, it always looks so natural and and and, and beautiful. Mm. So he's he's incredible the way he he dresses food. And I used to work with a boy called Paddy Cowell. Yep. He was the sous chef for Anthony when when I worked at Wild Honey. Mm. And the way he dresses food is is incredible as well. He's just so crisp and clean. Yep. So he is heavily influenced, I guess, by Anthony as well, isn't he? Yeah. I, I mean, I would, I would, I would assume so. But Pat's sort of found his own sort of style, and it, it's very, yeah. again, it's just, it's just so natural and clean. It's, it, yeah, it, it looks beautiful. Well, I took, uh, I took after uh, you mentioned them to me on, uh, on WhatsApp. I took a few of their pictures on the internet just to see so these these first four are, are paddy's ones yeah this dish i thought was absolutely stunning uh for my eye visually it's got it's got everything it's got color it's got texture it's got shape you know it's got the lovely part of the fish and stuff what what do you see in this do you reverse engineer how do you first go to how he's done it or do you do can you look at it just as a piece of piece of art because when i look at photography my immediate thing is to reverse engineer possibly how they've done it and then i see how beautiful it is no, I, I, I look at that and I just think that it's stunning. It just looks good. I, I don't think about how how he's done it because sort of n- known Patrick and, and having worked with him, yeah. you can see it's just it just comes naturally to him. Mm. That he's so talented. Yeah. He's yeah. Just, he's so talented at that. And I look at his food and I just think just so beautiful and clean. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, isn't it, really? Because again, there'll be there'll be photographers, we've got a few in here. There'll be photography photographers rather have exactly that same impact on me you know it, it's just something that speaks to you on a on a different level doesn't it not necessarily a technical level but just more an emotional level and i think yeah. you know when you find artists like that chefs photographers you know it's inspiring isn't it really to try and emulate that although it's you realize how much hard work it is i mean that's a stunning dish that, that's beautiful you know and it's it's three things on the plate the asparagus mushrooms and sauce mm. but it just it's it's stunning Mm. Stunning the way the way he dresses is just yeah, and the precision of it I imagine is you know because again I've worked on shoots when you know you're having arguments about where to put put a piece of parsley or or, or something like that. I mean you can you can you can get into the weeds about it, and then as you said earlier, it looks contrite. Yeah, it really. So just to have that eye for composition, balance, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's immense. Yeah, it's immense. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we got a few of his. Thought that was that was pretty yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it's just two or three things on a plate, but mm. just just done so well. Mm. Yeah, so well. Yeah, and executed, I imagine, brilliantly. As well. I mean, look at that. That's, yeah. that's just crazy, isn't it? Really. Well, he's yeah. He's. I mean, he's he's just he's so he's just got away with making things look beautiful with the colours he uses and the way he dresses, and it's just so clean. And then I think the next two were Anthony's. I think. Yeah. No, that sort of that that sums that in the up. How it's it's just everything's on there. It looks natural, but. Mm. It's like it's like muscle memory for Anthony when he's dressing, and he he uses a, a lot of space. He uses a lot of the plate, okay, but everything just looks so mm. so natural. And it's he's just I don't know how he does it. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. Do you think? Did you see his process? Did, does he maybe sketch things out, or do you again? Do you think that's kind of natural and it's an evolution of? I I know that I'm going to start with the fish or the sauce or or whatever. 
He knows his colours. I think. I think he. I, th- I genuinely just think he can do it. He, he can. He can just do it. Throw like sort of four or five random things at him. Mm. He doesn't know what's coming, and he'll put it on a plate, and he'll make it look. You make it look amazing. It's a it's a real art, isn't it? You know, but it's it's one of those things that I guess you don't get lucky at these things. It's doing it for years yeah. and years and years, but also clearly being very talented as well. Yeah, you know, because you don't get any of these things for free, do you? Really, and you can't. You're not just naturally gifted at plating food. You just Same. work at it a lot, and then you get good. I was I was lucky enough to work with Anthony when he was when he well he is top of his game, but you know I'd never seen his as him learning. So I, I have no idea the sort of the work and effort he, he put into it yeah. when he was younger, yeah. learning his craft. Yeah. I just see him as this yeah. this guy. It's like the top footballers, isn't it? Yeah. It just looked like they've done, they've done it like that their entire life and they don't have to work hard. Yeah. And it's not true, is it? Not unless they play for Rangers. I've seen some horror performances there. <laughs> and then I just think the last one as well. I particularly like that one. Yeah, this this was a dish that... Oh, you know this? Yeah. So what what is it? I couldn't even work out what it was. So it's confit chicken wings. And he confits chicken wings, then debones them and he presses them and then you crisp them up. And I'm pretty sure that's his uh, cacio e pepe. Okay. Pasta. So it's, it's boneless chicken wings and, and mm. cheese and pepper pasta. Yeah. But yeah, I, I remember I remember doing these pastas. Uh, really? Oh, yeah. You'd be, you'd be in the weeds at lunch. <laughs> at, at lunch at World Honey, we used to, it was a massive lunch trade Monday to Friday. And we used to do a sort of de jour menu. And you do 80 covers, mm. 70 of them with this jour menu, and you do your 80 covers in an hour, an hour oh. and a half. Oh my. So you, you were you were busting it out, but Anthony watched everything, nothing left unless it was absolutely perfect. So, yeah, yeah I've, I've sweated. You know that intimately. <laughs> yeah. Again, just with colours wise, and also things like fried chicken uh, uh, tend to be a very hard thing to make look, t- clearly tastes amazing. Yeah. Can be a hard thing to style and look, look appetising, whereas yeah. that's straight away the way he's he's plated that again so so crisp and clean and just mm. there's so much love involved and not only the cooking of it but the way yeah it's all put together as, as a final product on the plate so yeah. much love involved in it that's a particularly nice dish as well i have to say you know yeah. do, uh, would he spend a lot of time and effort sourcing those kinds of- yeah i i think so i say i was never sort of part of that process with him it was yeah you, you you'd get these beautiful plates and yeah what about here then? I guess have a budget for these things and you can choose foundation is for your dish. Yeah. Do you go fairly, fairly standard, you know, white off white, that kind of stuff? Or do you have anything that is a little uh, riskier? <laughs> no, we're very, we're a, a bistro and a, and a pub. Yeah. So we sort of just try and stick to the white, white plates, mm. nothing too fancy, you know, good, good quality plate. They've, they've got a little bit of detail into them, but yeah. then today we, tr- we try and stick to sort of white playing plates and let, let the food sort of do the talking. So are there any other chefs out there that you think are, you know, pushing it? Like the ones that are really out there? Just up the road at the Hand and Flowers, yep. Tom and Tomo's food looks mm. looks incredible and, and Sarah, the coach, yep. so, so, so beautiful. Mm. So these these are these are the places I sort of like and uh, and love the look of, look of the food. Yep. But um, and you get guys like Daniel Hum at Eleven Madison Park. His mm. food's very intricate and complex. Looks unlike anything else mm. in the world. It's so complex and, and yeah. well put together. What other sort of things inspire you then? Or are you kind of comfortable in where you are and you don't feel the need to sort of push that too much? Purely visually here, we're not talking about the, the cooking side. I'm I'm fairly confident mm. in sort of what I like yep. to, to dress and to see. I can appreciate, obviously, everyone's style and everyone's different but mm. i i sort of know what we do here and yeah. what suits us and yeah and how we like to to dress food i don't sort of draw inspiration from anywhere and sort of we just sort of do what we like and yeah. we feel natural but i i appreciate yeah the way everyone dresses food i think it's a really interesting point because again the other chefs i've talked to doing this podcast um confidence does play such a large part in plating specifically i'm sure because so many chefs have said you know less is becoming more it must be very easy to fall into the trap of trying to do too much yeah so having that confidence of 16 years and and longer with some of the chefs i've talked to that you know this is enough um this looks great i'm confident with it there you go i'm not necessarily going to compete yeah i mean we just we just like to to have things look clean and sharp Mm. And sort of to have nowhere to hide really with it. That's brave. Yeah, I love that. I mean, what what is on toast? That must have been. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's really is. Or like, <laughs> yeah. Another dish we do is barbecued pork chop, mm. cream cheese that we season up 
mm. a bit of spiced and do ya, and then a homemade coleslaw, and that's it. It's yeah. so simple. It's it's three things on a plate, but I I just think it, it looks good. And those three things, by the way, did sound amazing. Good choices. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people think, look at me, and think cream cheese and pork chop. Well, uh, yeah. uh, trust me, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to your staff and your team, then. Because your your plating style by your own is simple and clean, is it a relatively easy thing to then communicate to them what you want to do? When you were learning with Anthony and stuff, it was it was hard to keep up. Yeah, is that kind of a benefit to your style? Then I guess is that it is easier to pass on. It is simple. The the food we do is simple, but in doing that, there's nowhere to hide. So if everything's not. So it's even okay. So that's it should be is even more important. You got to know exactly where things go and mm. keep things tight. And so, although the food we do is simple, is the, the, it can look quite different mm. depending on who, who's dressing it. Okay, it's just a case of I'm trying to bring it all all together. Yeah, I, said, I, I like to get everyone from the top to the bottom in the mm. kitchen dressing the food. Yep, because that's how you learn. Mm. But that's as it is really, where it goes. Yeah, still pressure. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, simple food can it can look really beautiful and amazing and crisp and clean yeah or it can look really bad if it's not executed properly yeah but even even with the simple things it then mm. it can go horribly wrong so oh, I, c- I can believe it again in photography the simple things can yeah. you, you 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 get found out pretty easy don't you yeah really? if you can't do the simple thing then yeah you absolutely get found out yeah it's a nightmare when it goes wrong at 80 cover saturday night dinner service that's when you don't want it to go wrong <laughs> I can imagine. what kind of common mistakes do you see out there? Would it be things like just being sloppy? Would it be things like overcomplicating things? What What do you see out there when you go out to eat? Well, I mean, again, it's a it's a difficult one because what what's an error for me mm. is right for someone else. Yep. You know, it's, like I said, it's it's so subjective, and and I, I appreciate and understand that everyone in the industry has their own style. That's yep. what makes the industry so so special. Yep. Things that sort of I see that I wouldn't do is, mm. is things that are just maybe. Difficult to eat, like over over complicated. Uh, okay. And too much, too much on a plate, basically. Yep. Too much on a plate, just uh, like so they just kind of just chuck so much stuff on it, see what fits. Yeah. And sticks for us. So yeah, sort of thing, and and can sometimes look clumsy, but like I said, it's clumsy for me, but mm. someone else's art. So yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I'll never say anything negative about the way someone goes about their craft. Well, I think that, I think that I think that's fair enough. I think that's fair enough. I mean, are, are there any are there any dishes that you've kind of re-engineered? in terms of, you know, when you plated something and you've had it on the menu for like, I don't know, a week or so and then you suddenly think, oh, I really don't like this night and you'll do it again. Yeah, so Chef Bren used to used to say to me, when you've had a dish all for a while, mm. he says, you need you need to fall back in love with it. So okay. Chef Bren would, would have a dish on and then he'll tweak just a little this thing on it mm. and the bones of the dish are still exactly the same, but he's just tweaked one little thing. Yeah. And he, and he that's terms, to, sorry to interrupt you, but is that in terms of, how the dish is made or just more to how the dish is then present presented oh okay presented the ingredients will all be the same but you'll just kind of re- completely reinvent yeah how it's how it's put on yeah and 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 chef brown would always say she it just makes you fall back in love with it mm-hmm. and he's he's so right yeah he's so right you know in this industry when you're cooking the same things every day and dressing them every mm-hmm. day and things can get a bit stale so if you just make one little tweak mm-hmm. And it does, it, it's one of the best things he's ever said to me, which, and, it, and it's true, it does make you just fall back in love with the dish. That's fascinating. I I, I, I can completely understand that. Because yes, when you when you do things professionally and you do it by rote and you've got to a standard of it doing it incredibly well, to then sort of break that back down again and, and almost start afresh. Yeah. That's rather refreshing, I would imagine. I mean, and it's it, it can be the, the littlest of things as well, just putting herbs through a sauce or, or, or moving one thing from one side of the plate to the other and... Mm carving something a different way yeah it's it, it can be the smallest of changes but it does really sort of it reignites your passion yeah. for the dish because i imagine when you have dishes that people are expecting to be on your menu and again yes you, you you've had it on there for a while to, to 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 have that creative input again is quite good yeah 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 it's nice my last question for you um scott uh during my, my <laughs> i came across an interesting fact about you and i just wanted to ask you about it it was from, I think, from the caterer of You Know What's Coming. It's Greg's, isn't it? It is Greg. <laughs> you, were, you were asked uh, about this, and it was, I want to say, 36 Greg pas- Greg's pasties in 24 hours. Yeah. Explain. <laughs> Look, I love Greg's. It's my favorite restaurant. <laughs> we all love Greg's. <laughs> and again, it's the simplicity of their food. Yeah. It's, it's one thing, and you eat it, and yeah. you're like, oh, it's the 36? Yeah, yeah, 36. So, yeah, so my, so my missus was going away. She was actually going to uh, walk part of the great wall of china yeah and um 
So I had a, an empty house and I, I thought I'd make the most of it. So mm. the, the, second, the second she left, was, wasn't even out the driveway yet in the taxi, down to Greg's, yeah. got, my, got, my, got my pastry face, back up a road, sat on the sofa <laughs> and got my jammies on, got the, the, and that the, was it. the duvet down. Yeah, this didn't, I just didn't move. Um, was it all the same pasty? No, no, it was oh, a selection. Yeah. It was just like they were all savoury, no, yeah. no, like no, no sweet ones, but just flat like, out. Yeah, it was, it was a brilliant day. I felt like a good day. <laughs> it was. I don't know why I done it. I just, I just, I just love Greg's. I love it. <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed. Thirty six. That is amazing. Brilliant, Scott. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been really interesting talking to you. Pleasure. Lovely stuff. Do you think you'd be able to talk me through the dish that you're actually going to be plating for me today? Yeah. So the the dish that we're going to do today is sort of it's a dish that sort of just came about. My accident quite recently. Um, so it's a it's a treacle cured piece of bavette, which we marinade in treacle and soy water bath, and then we barbecue it and let it chill. So it's, it's sliced and served cold, and it's just with with some homemade pickles, bit of a black garlic emulsion, and some mm. bitter leaves, and it's just really simple dish. But mm. so it just came about it by accident. We found we had a, an abundance of sort of trim from bavette. Yep, we wanted to do something with it, so it's it's just a really simple. Okay. Trico cured beef with some pickles. And how did you decide to plate it? So do you have, is it quite a colourful dish? Can I bet it's obviously quite dark? So you then add some, some ingredients to add an extra bit of colour to lift it or? Yeah, so we've got, we've got all, all the sort of, the bavette is dark, yeah, especially since it's cured in treacle and then mm. barbecued. So it's, you know, it's almost black. Yep. And then, so yeah, we try and bring some colour into it. So we've got, our pickles are all sort of different colours. So we've got some onions, some cornichons and a shallot. Wow. And then we've got some fresh tomato, just for a bit of freshness. Mm. And then the bitter leaves we use, sort of freezy and, and red chicory. So you can mm. get the contrasting colours there. So it is actually quite a colourful dish then, is it? It's, it's, it's fairly colourful, yeah. And then we, we just finish it with a, a, the Scottish rapeseed oil. So it's mm -hmm. quite a vibrant orange oil that just finishes the dish. And it yeah. gives it a bit of nuttiness to it as well when you eat it. Okay, well, can't can't wait to see it. Can't wait to see it. The vet is pretty much my favourite cut. I yeah, like it. It, so good, isn't it? It's one of, one of the things that we've pretty much always got in the menu. Really? Yeah. So to start dressing, we sort of start start with the the beef. Um, tend to always try and put sort of the proteins on first. Yeah. What do we got there? Uh, then just a little bit of the rapeseed oil there, just to help sort of glaze it up, so it got a nice shine to it. It doesn't mm. look dry and and sad. Yep. And then uh, just a little bit of fresh chives over there. Mm. Again, that's just for. For the colour, yeah. Obviously, that onion onion goes very well in this dish with the beef. Okay. And then we get the the black garlic emulsion, which is like like I was saying when when you're piping the the emulsions that hold the bag at the level uh -huh. you want your your dot to finish at. Yep. And the emulsion should just do the work. Just sort of falls over itself and okay and sits very nicely. And then we've just got some of these balsamic pickled silver skin onions. Where do you source your beef from? Is that all fairly local, is it? Uh, well, we use a, a, a company in London called HG Walters for the beef, mm -hmm. um, which is in, in, incredible, the babette we get from them. Yeah. So we've got the, the balsamic silver skins and then we've got some apple pickled baby onions. Yeah. I mean, the colours look amazing already. Yeah. It's such a dark meat. Just, yeah, just try and keep it quite exciting. Yeah. And then we'll just get some, some cornichons. Bit of fresh tomato again, just keeps a, keeps a freshness in there. Mm hmm And gives us a bit of, bit of colour. Yep. Then we've got here some pickled enoki mushrooms. Wow. And how long has this been on the menu? Is this fairly new? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I'll say. Four days now. Oh, four days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Okay. And they've gone down fairly well. Yeah, it goes down. It goes down well. Yeah, Pe people seem to be enjoying it. It sells sells quite well. Mm -hmm. And here we've just got some pickled shallot rings. This is a, a white wine pickle. Yeah. Okay. So we do we do all our pickles and stuff in house. So. Oh wow. Okay. You try and do as much of that as possible. Yeah, we we, we try. Yeah, it's quite it's quite time consuming, but. Yeah. It's quite it's quite nice and rewarding to have everything sort of preserved that you can sort of dip into when you need. Yeah. To hear them. I think people people like that though as well, don't they? To know that kind of everything is made as much in house as possible. Yeah. And, you know, by the guys that are actually serving it and stuff. 
yeah, it just gives us, gives us that sort of love as well. Yeah, towards the ingredients. So that's it. Uh, that's just some some red red endive. Mm-hmm. It's bitterness, and then just finish it with some of the yeah some of the frizzy, which again is quite quite bitter, but gives it a nice freshness. I love the height to it as well. Yeah, so it's sort of just build it up, try and keep everything tight and compact. Yeah. Um, that this dish is quite different to most other things we do because we sort of hid the protein mm. behind everything. But I just I just think it looks quite from a from a photography point of view. So whenever I come in and work with restaurants and stuff, it's it's always a bit of a pain because you can't then see you can't see everything. Yeah, you know what I mean. Because especially when it comes to steak, a visual point of view, you kind of want to see the red of it. You want to see the the, yeah. the that side of it. I completely understand because it looks. It looks stunning from your point of view. It's just from my photography point of view. Yeah. You kind of want to tell that story of everything that's in the dish. So it's quite, it's a bit of a battle sometimes, isn't it, really? Yeah. In the, the visual and, you know, how you guys want to do it. Because it still looks stunning. Okay, yeah. Because it caused the beef's cured as well. It's cured. I mean, it is, it's cooked sort of medium rare. But mm. because it's cured, it's sort of lost a bit of its color. Okay. So it's it's not got that sort of nice vibrant red to it. Yeah. yeah and that's everything. So it's uh, tri- treacle, treacle cured beef with homemade pickles and some bitter leaf. Scott, looks amazing. Really, really like it. As always, thank you so much for watching all the way through to the end of this video. If you feel like you've learned anything, it would be amazing to know what it is in the comments below. It would also be awesome if you'd let me know which chefs you think produce some of the best looking plates of food in the world. And then who knows, if this channel grows, maybe I can get them involved. So as always, please comment, like and subscribe. See you next time.